All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, eights for eight day was a large struggle, but very rewarding. And I don't know if all that came across uh, in the first iteration of the video. So I said, I would like to get a video out and thank the people that helped first. And then I needed to do basically like a narrative or a screenplay for what happened. Make sure I get all the facts. A lot of crazy things went down. I wanted to make sure I got the order right. So I wanted to do a video explaining the whole day because so many things happened. I figured I would storyboard it all in a text file and get it right, read over it a few times, make sure it was good, and then use it as a guideline for the video. I had to type so much here, I figured I would post the whole thing to give people a read and have some people proofread it. So I did that already. Some of you have already read this. And here's where we begin. Sunday, December 8th, Judgment Day for Eights for Eight at this point. It's almost a joke with the eight theme. Everything is at eight. Today is December 8th. I figure it's got to happen today. So around 7 a.m., Mitch brings his truck and trailer up to my house, and we load the car up in the morning. We set out for a approximate two-hour drive to Atco for a test and tune session. It's supposed to be sunny and clear, about 50 degrees. Perfect day to get it done. We miss a turn or two on our way down. I think we were BSing about stuff, and we take a longer route unintentionally. So we get to the track, we pull in, no problem, get our spectator and driver pass, 9.30ish. So I lose track here a while because we're trying to start the car and warm it up, prep it, double check everything, tighten things, get this thing together. The car would not start, and this was extremely frustrating. I do not know why uh, the battery was not struggling. It was just cranking and cranking and cranking and would not start. So... We check everything out, finally get it fired, struggle through that, warm it up a while, let it charge the battery after beating the crap out of it on the starter, put it on the trans brake a few times, warm up the oil, the trans, everything else, test the boost control, test the launch pre uh, pressure, everything looks good, let the fan turn on and off a few times, heat cycle it, good enough to come off the trailer. Uh, as soon as we back it off the trailer to drive around and warm up the diff, uh, left front tire is nearly flat. It's not totally flat, but it looks awful. So we're like, whatever. It's been sitting a long time. Who knows how bad this just slowly leaks or whatever. It's also a skinny. Maybe it just looks awful. So we'll fill it up, drive it around, see how it does throughout the day, right? So that's what we do. Mark shows up, starts to prep. He's going to be driving for the day since he has an NHRA license and a five-layer fire suit knows the people at Atco, etc. If I were to make a pass and go, first pass was 920, I'll spoil it now, and they decide to kick me out, that's it. Can't race the car anymore, so we didn't want to do that. So we take a quick look at oil level, coolant, fuel, tire pressure, everything we can think of. I jump in the car to give it a little bit of weight ballast so Mark and Mitch can set up the anti-roll bar with driver weight already in the car and we are ready to make our first hit.
All right, guys, so first pass of the day, 11.47 a.m., we go over a first pass strategy and agree. Let's leave on approximately 14 pounds, run the same boot mount of boost the rest of the track. So everything is good. Mark comes up to the line, tags the limiter in all three gears. <laughs> he obviously isn't used to the car. Stage up, let go, and I don't think that Mark waited for full boost. He left on about seven pounds, and it went to about a 15 pound average after two seconds, which you'll see here. Still getting used to the car, never having driven it, Mark did bump the limiter in one, two gear shift. And once he grabbed third, he decided to stay in it. He also tagged it a little bit on the two, three I. So out the back, there was an issue. Uh, we never saw a time. Right before this, uh, they waved us around someone who was having trouble. And apparently they were running no time, obviously today. And they thought we were a no-time car, so they turned off the boards. So I was like, we ran eight the first pass, <laughs> and the boards never lit. No, that, that wasn't the case. I said to Mitch and everybody after we shut off the camera, I was like, hey, guys, did your boards malfunction, or is that just, what's the story? And they said, well, that's no time. Yeah, you guys wanted a time, right? And we're like, yeah, we're not a no-time car. Is he going to get a slip? Uh, otherwise, we're, you know, he's going to be upset. So, yeah, they said the slip should come out. And it did. So, real quick, this is the uh, the burnout segment here. All over that 7200 boy. And then this is the pass. So let's, uh, let's back out a tiny bit. This is the pass right here. That's the burnout. I'm sorry. Can I do this? Let's go to the full thing. Zoom all. Here's the pass. So you can see he comes up on the limiter. And he left at approximately 9 pounds of boost. And then about 17 pounds peak. So limiter, he makes the shift about 15 PSI. 15, 8. Limiter here, limiter, limiter. 15 pounds out the back door. So the car goes, awesomely enough, a, uh, do we have the slip here, the 920 slip? Where do I got the 920 slip, boys? Let me just show you the slip. It'll be easier. Uh, forgive me, not being organized. That's how it is, right? Oh, uh, here it is. Here it is. There we go. This is it for sure. So, first pass off the trailer with the conservative tune-up. Car goes 921 at 144 on uh, 15, 16 pounds. A 9-pound launch. Cuts a 132.60, 580 in the 8th. 117, basically, so... Uh, we were ecstatic with that and extremely happy. At the starting line, we had no idea, so Mitch and I were like, man, Mitch said 9-2-0, and I said low 9 for sure. So Mark shows up with the slip <laughs> after we run back to the pits. It's a 9-21 at 144.7, so it's a 145 nearly. We're like, this is incredible. Obviously, this is starting out to be a good day, good start. Everything looks good. We check the data log. Uh, we know where to go from here. I check the log, confirm he only left on nine pounds. Not enough boost for the serious launch. About 15 average down the pass. Uh, I let Mark know he just got to wait a little bit on the brake and uh, everything else. So we add a little bit more duty cycle to the boost controller on the top end of the track after the launch, uh, expecting around 19 pounds. And that's where we get into pass number two. <laughs>
All right, so second pass of the day. Mark goes back up and lets this thing eat. It hangs a crazy high wheelie, and he has to pedal it twice to get it to come down. Sets it down nice. He continues on, and we see a 908 at 151 miles an hour, and we're like, wow, man, if he didn't have to mess with that wheelie, we probably would have gone eights on the second hit. So he comes back around, and we check the logs and discuss a plan of attack once again. Meanwhile, every pass, we are getting a lot of oil in the engine bay and windshield that we're trying to locate. It can't find it. Uh, the car is running fine, so we're pretty sure it's not blow-by or broken piston or anything funny. We're just cleaning it in between rounds until we find exactly what it is. So I jump onto the log, and I go, okay, Mark, you know, so we have a six-pound wastegate spring. You left on 14 there with no timing retard, and you had to pedal it twice. Uh, looking at the duty cycle on the boost controller, it's set to 38%, and 14 was too much. So let's lower it on the launch and try again. So he agrees. So since we're at 38%, I'm like, hey, I'll cut that in half. We'll run roughly 20%. Should be halfway between the gate spring, which is 6, and the amount we left on, which was seemingly too much, about 14 PSI. So I slightly raised overall boost amount to get closer to a 21, 20 pound range where I know the turbo wants to quit making really good horsepower. So should be a perfect baseline to go 890, go home, and we all agree. At that point, I raised the rev limiter to 7400 a little bit to give him some wiggle room. And also, Mark was nicking it at 7200, so... You know, his vision up close isn't the greatest, so I was like, hey, oh, we'll do 7,400 while I do everything else here. I lowered the launch boost to hopefully about 9 or 10 pounds. We lined back up and took it into the staging lanes, and while we were there, I changed the dash a little bit so that Mark could see a little better. And also, we found out where the oil was coming from. We realized that we never plugged or did anything with the knock sensor holes. So we basically have two holes the size of an oil fill cap venting under the intake. So at least we know what that is, but not much we can do now. You know, I was like, it'd be funny if we shove a t-shirt in there, but that, that's more of a fire hazard than it is a help. So here's the second pass. Uh, Mark here left on a solid 14 pounds, and he had to pedal this wheelie here, as you can see. He made the 1-2 at 6,200 a little early with the wheelie and stuff going on. 2-3 uh, at 6,300. And then out the back, uh, 6,600 on 20 pounds. And we had a very nice trap speed. Everything else was going very good. So here we go. We line up for pass number three, hoping to get it done. <laughs>
fucking boost. It, felt like it left on probably fucking five. It felt like it yeah, it felt, it felt like it was on on two pounds. Yeah. It just didn't. It didn't even pick a tire up. Maybe that's too little duty now. Yeah, I put the duty back to where it was and put put another two on top and we're just fucking gonna go to the back of it. It probably uh. Uh, that little bit, uh, we probably should have tested it here, but yeah, we'll put it back to what, 14? Or just a little bit below it? Because that 20%, the boost controller probably doesn't work. Yeah. It's a solenoid, so sometimes they don't work until you hit like 25. Yeah, I'm like, fuck. So that was probably six, like right? Turtle. Six like, pounds. Fuck. Yeah, I was like, uh, still on 950. Yeah, uh, I was expecting like, come on! And I'm like, fuck! <laughs> it, it, it freight train though, because the boost came in. Yeah. It went 6'1 at 118. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, yeah, pretty... everything's on, Mitch. You know what it is? Those, the electronic boost control solenoids, when you get under a certain percentage, they stop working. And I put it at 20. It's, it's, it's leaving on gate. All right, ladies and gentlemen, third pass of the day, 2 p.m. Everything is looking good. Medium boost on launch, so hopefully about 10 pounds decent power up top same or a little bit more than before all we need to do is get it and go home so mark comes up on the brake for a little bit uh long enough for sure for him to hit target boost lets it fly and this thing just turtles out of the hole i'm like man did he not wait long enough it seems like that was plenty long in my head uh did we lose like a coupler or something wrong or what's going on so this car comes into boost hard and uh, look great and blows down the track and they got a clean run i see a 947 at 149 i'm like man for a, a awful launch that 149 is nice the motor seems okay but why did it leave so slow I'm not totally sure about that i walk back and i'm saying to mitch hey you know did Mi did mark leave early uh, i'm not too sure about that uh, data log will tell us obviously halfway back i go you know what he might have turned the boost controller switch off. There's literally a switch that turns the solenoid on. And without that, you can't get any more than six pounds. I've done it on the dyno and you've got, you have seen it on the live stream if you watched it. And I was like, man, that, that might've been it. I'm like, man, Mark forgot the switch. So I get to the pits and Mark is already there and he jumps on the brake and boost seems pretty low and he does it again. And as I get closer, it definitely seems low. So I crack the door and I check the switch. It's turned on for sure. And Mark is like, you know what? It's just not making any boost out of the hole, which you can see in the video. And immediately I'm like, you know what? Uh, I bet I put the duty cycle too low for the boost controller to work. Uh, like I explained in the video there, the four port doesn't like to go below a certain percentage. It just simply doesn't work. So the effective range is like 25 to 75%. And in my haste, I'm like, oh, I'll cut the launch boost amount to 20% and that put us at wastegate. So I pull a log on this guy and yep, it leaves at six PSI. And I'm like, man, I know exactly what happened. This is all my fault. These four port controllers will not usually gain any boost at all in, in, until the 20s percentage wise. And I put you guys at 20. So, uh, you know, totally my fault and my quick, uh, okay, brain cut the number 40 in half and go to 20, uh, it didn't click in my head that 20% uh, isn't going to work at all. So apologies to everyone. Uh, Mitch is on the wipe down committee for the oil. We're running out of time. Uh, the, it's now 2 p.m. and the track closes at 4. That's okay. Uh, quick once over, continue wiping off, check some things, change the tune. Mark is like, you know what? I have enough experience with this car. You can see in the in-car video, he's like, put it right back to the crazy launch. I know what the car will do. I have enough passes under my belt. I don't care what happens. Uh, I changed the launch duty to th from 38 on the first pass that made 14 and a half pounds. Uh, I put in 36 just in case. And I bump a tiny bit more up and top, a little bit over the turbo's efficiency at this point, And I feel like we're ready to go. So... You know, a bunch of dumb stuff. The car is doing fine, trapping better every pass. Every little bit of boost added. It's shifting okay. The converter looks great. The data logs on the RPM drop are awesome. All that's ironed out. Fourth pass. Here we go, boys. It's 3 p.m. Track closes at 4. Uh, let's get this thing done with everything we learned and grab the 8 and go home.
Amen. Hey, Amen. Hey, what do you need? Did you tell Matt to come over here. Is your ace for eight? Yeah, brother. Try it. Hey, Matt, can you turn the GoPro off so we don't kill the battery? kidding so guys fourth pass of the day 308 p.m mark lines up and we are all ready to get that eight he comes up to the line and hits the brake and brings the car up on boost the car in the left takes off a little bit early uh sooner than it takes for my car to make full boost and i think the competitive nature in mark would not let him let that guy go so he lets go a little bit early and the car does not even hike the wheels. Eventually it comes on full boost strong and goes 900 at 153. I could tell he didn't wait long enough. He left a little bit early, but what am I going to say? 9001 when I checked the slip, I, I, I honestly couldn't believe it. Second 90 of the day. But I was very happy with the 153 mile an hour. That is pretty serious business. No big deal. Car still picked up mile an hour. But the issue is we are at 3.07 p.m. We got to clean up the car with the oil 
check the logs. Yes, car left on six pounds. Yes, no problem. We just need more boost to leave, and this thing is in the bag. Uh, again, went 153 out the back. Motor is still good, even despite of the oil leaks. I'm like, hey, Mark, just stand on this thing until you wait. Like, make sure it's good, and then wait two more seconds, and then let go. So, <laughs> no matter what, just make sure it's leaving on full boost. He said, give me all the boost from the first launch, and I'll flip this thing over or go eights. No problem. We had no suspension limiters, which we should have had on the car. Between passes, we were adjusting the adjustable front shocks, but it was seemingly doing nothing at this point. Uh, they're old, and they're on the car, and uh, there's not much you know you could expect out of them at this point. So, Mark said again, go back to that tune where I had to pedal the giant wheelie, and I'll just pull second early, or pedal, or... I'll figure it out. I have enough passes. I know what the car is going to do. I'll figure it out. I said, you know what? You got it, bud. Mark is mostly suited up. And we are ready to go to the starting line. We left early, as we did all day, to get to the starting line before Mark because he could get there before us. So it is 3.30 p.m. The track closes at 4 p.m. Not many people are in line. We jog up to the start, and we are waiting for Mark to come rolling down and Mark never makes it to the lanes. Uh, I look at my phone quick, and he texted me and says the battery is dead on the car. It won't start. And uh, at this point, I couldn't believe it. This is ridiculous. The car has started all day fine. So I yelled to Mitch and everyone else, hey, battery's dead. I took off running. So we get to the car. Mark is already gloves off, trying to check cables and other things quick just to make sure nothing funny is happening. Mitch says, yo, I got jumper cables in my truck. I say, hey, Mark, give me the keys to your car. I'll pull the car over. Mitch will get the cables, and we'll get this thing going. No problem. I run to Mark's car, and Mark is parked next to Mitch's truck. And I can see Mitch is turning the truck inside out and can't find the cables. So before I even do anything, I go, hey, Mitch. I rip open the door. You have these cables. He said, man, I can't find them. I'm like, oh boy. So I run back to the, <laughs> I run back to Mark and I go, what's going on? Uh, Mark had already got the guy next to us with the Fairmont. And he's like, hey buddy, uh, this guy had a spare battery. So he runs the spare battery over and I'm like, uh, well, we're kind of still screwed because I don't have extra jumper cables. So I'm like, you know what? Flip the battery over and touch the posts. I'll start this thing. So he he flips the battery over and battery acid starts pouring out. And I'm like, oh, yes. Uh, you know, this this is how today is going. So he stops, obviously. I'm like, seriously, this is like a Discovery Channel or a movie uh, manufactured drama at this point. This is totally ridiculous. So I run to the nearest three people I can see in eyesight. They have nothing. The fourth guy I run to has a jumper pack, but he hasn't hooked up to things, and it's obviously been charging that stuff all day. I look at the display. It says 11.2 volts. I'm like, uh, you know, thank you so much, dude. Can I try this? He says, yes, sir. <laughs> I run his jumper pack over to the Mustang. I hook it up to the battery, which is in the cr uh, trunk, and it cranks and will not start, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, what do I do now? So I realize I have firewall connections on the front of the car. Uh, so my battery is running to a firewall, pass through post. I'm like, on the firewall, I'm only about a foot or two to the battery in the ground. I'm going to hook it up there, and that should give us a little bit extra juice because it has a shorter amount of time to travel to the starter. So... We hook this thing up to the firewall post. I turn the jumper pack on. I'm like, yo, Mark, fire it. It cranks awful, but fires. And it is lit and running and everything is good. So that is where we start the fifth pass of the day at 3.30 p.m. So now it is 3.30 p.m. And I run straight up to the track official and I say, hey, buddy, it's us again. Battery is dead in this car, and we cannot shut it off or restart. There isn't many cars left at the end of the day here. 
I apologize, but can we please roll straight up through and up into the burnout box? And he says, no problem. You got it. He stops everybody ahead of time. Mark comes flying down the lanes, and I run up, and 10 of us are simulating an air traffic control device on an aircraft carrier. We're flagging them all straight in. He doesn't shut off. It doesn't slow out down below 20 miles an hour, and he goes straight into the burnout box. He does his burnout, and I make sure he is lined up quick and easy, and Mark knows what's going on. He's already fine. He's already in the groove. I give him a thumbs up, and away we go. gentlemen mark sits on the brake and waits and waits and waits and i'm like man that's it let it fly dude boom he comes off the brake the car goes into a nice big wheel stand past the 60 foot he grabs second in air the car is straight as a ruler i said man here we go car sets down bounces lightly still totally straight doesn't have to steer it at all at Co, awesomely, you can see the 60 foot on the clock. If you look in the upper right, one of my favorite things about the track, 129. I said, man, that's all over the rear wheels. That's an incredible 60 foot. I'm like, all we got to do is grab that 2-3 clean, and that motor's got to stay together, obviously. 2-3 shift uh, sounds nice and clean from as far away as I am. He goes through the eighth mile, and immediately I yell, that's it. That's the eight-second pass. Motor holds together. Everything is good. Car goes 885 at 153. Finally. I don't think we have any time left in the day. No smoke on D-cell. I wait long enough. I shut off the video camera early, but I wait long enough to see Mark make a right turn and heading on the return road, and we head back to the pits. So, as expected... Uh, Mark is about a 12 out of 10 excited, and he should be. So he opens a trunk on his car and <laughs> cracks a champagne bottle and sprays it all over the car. 
for a celebration. I have a video of that. It's done. There's no more time left in the day. The car is still running fine. And I'm like, let's get dinner and go home. And without Mitch and I pushing the car into my garage for more repairs. Thank you, everybody. So quick overview. You can see Mark comes up, gets on the brake. And right about here, he just kisses the 13 or so pounds I expected to leave on. And right around here, he leaves. This is the brake obviously turning off. 13, six pounds leave. And he comes out. It goes into a pretty big wheelie. He pedals for a fraction of a second, I think 25 milliseconds, and realizes his brain, I think muscle memories, uh, don't pedal, don't worry, just grab high. So he goes into second gear. Uh, boost does not drop off at all. He short shifts the 1-2 at 6,400. Uh, the converter, Jake's converter, doing an incredible job. I said, absolutely cannot drop below 5,800 RPM, no matter how short we shift, so we don't bend the rods out of this SBE. Bam. Uh, it drops to a minimum of 5,855. Does incredible. So he winds it all the way out, and I'm thinking to myself, just make that clean 2-3, dude, please. 7,200. Mark does his 2-3. The car drops to 6,100, so it goes 1,000 RPM drop, which is great. And you can also see here the car will peak out at 25 pounds, but fall off to 22. And this is when I talked about the turbo being out of compressor and out of power and turbine and everything. So what's neat to see is since I'm not targeting a certain amount and it can't adjust it, uh, it's going high and then falling off. So 6,000, it's doing 25, and 7,000 is doing 22. And here you can see the same thing. It comes up a tiny bit, about 25. Through the traps, the car was going 6,800 at 23 pounds. Inlet temperature was definitely higher than the lower boost passes, showing that the turbo is done. But you know what? The car went 885. We didn't even have suspension limiters on it. Ran our goal. Mark obviously pumped out of his mind. Uh, some of you might not have realized why he was so excited. Uh, now, after you watch this in its entirety, you can realize this was the fifth pass. Uh, this is all we had to do, and he did it. Super excited. Mark's the guy for that stuff. Man, Mark is the most excitable dude ever. Perfect guy for this stuff. So, hope you guys enjoy that, and we'll go over some more. <laughs> Boys, we 
closing i just wanted to say thanks to everybody again man i got a huge list of people i'm gonna try to get everybody in here again i gotta say thanks to mitch and mark for helping with the build and towing the thing and putting in engines and just spending the time and going to the track and uh there's a lot involved in this if you guys haven't done it before and you have to be persistent if you watch this video you'll see uh, we never gave up. Uh, we pushed through the whole time, and that's what it takes to reach these goals. Sometimes it looks easy. Sometimes it is actually easy, and sometimes you work this hard for it, and you never really tell anybody, or they never realize. So uh, thanks to them for all of that. And first, I want to thank Holly because they sponsored most of the parts for this car. I have the spreadsheet. I have all the build pricing, and we'll go over that in a second, but... They provided most of the parts. Uh, obviously, I busted the oil pan, and I broke a ton of things, and we had a fire, and I melted the engine harness out of the car. Uh, without their help, uh, it would have taken even longer, and we might have even quit because of how this car was just a, a serious uphill battle, uh, very difficult at every step of the way. And honestly, sometimes this is how they go. I would say Every fifth car does this to me. I usually have outstanding luck, and this one just fought me every chance it had. So I want to first start by thanking VS Racing. I got his turbo and wastegates on here, intercooler, a bunch of scratch and dent stuff. I've been working with Varen for 15 years. He is an awesome guy. His products speak for themselves. Customer service out of this world. The hot side parts are from Monkey Fab. Uh, it made building the kit incredibly easy. And this is another thing where I like to talk about. Uh, there's room in the budget here if, if you didn't buy these pieces, but it made the build easier and it made it easier to upgrade. So I'll talk about that more in the price sheet, but all the Monkey Fab hot side parts. I'd like to thank Jake's performance for the converter. He nailed it the first time. I told him what I had and what I wanted, and he built exactly what I asked for. He does it every time, does an awesome job. So this is a budget converter that they sell. So hit him up if you want that. I'd like to thank Cameron and his boss, Chris. They sent me a spare 4.8 after I smashed my other one to pieces uh, multiple times. We put another piston in it and rod, broke it again, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'd like to thank them for the support. His boss, Chris, everybody over there at A&H Performance in Clarksville, Tennessee area. I'd like to thank Brad from Snake Eater. He has really raised the bar on the cheap but very good injector market. I trust these things. They are awesome. The price for the performance and everything you can get out of them. 
there I, I said in many of my videos there is a there's a missing window here for a middle-sized well-priced injector and this dude jumped all over it and he has a great product and people might talk trash just like they talk trash on vs stuff but uh, look where people are now with uh, VS turbos and snake eater injectors. Uh, the only people that have bad stuff to say are people that usually sell a com you know a competitive product. So keep that in mind. Not everything is bad. Not everything is great. Uh, do your own research. But all I can say is nothing but great stuff from Brad, VS, Jakes, all of these people. Also, I'd like to thank PCMs for less. They had sent me. A bunch of camshafts to try, like I said in the other video. Uh, PCMs for less cams and Elgin Industries, who make the Sloppy Stage 2 that we stumbled on, that they even named it after me in the catalog. Those guys are rock stars. That's awesome. I want to test more of their cams. So like I said, uh, both of these cams made roughly the same power, but it's because the turbo was at its limit. So I like both of these cams. Uh, the Sloppy Stage 1 is great for like a daily drivable. The Sloppy Stage 2 has the audio and everything else. And the PCM for less cam sounds ridiculous. That 232 thing is awesome. I like it just because it sounds dumb. Uh, it might not be the greatest for a daily driver, but if you've got a race car, you know, there's all these options. They all work well. All these companies are great to deal with. They've been amazing. A surprise sponsor was War Performance. They sent me a bunch of connectors and the throttle body to try, and I threw it into the budget. I thought it was a good thing because there are cheaper throttles that we don't have trouble with, but other people have reported issues with them, and they whistle and other things. So for slightly more money, War Performance sells a fantastic throttle with none of these issues. And also, when I had the fire and other difficulties, they stepped up and sent extra parts. They didn't need to. I didn't ask. They're just awesome people. And they never once said, you have to show our product. You, we'd like, you know, they didn't pay me or anything. So I just thought it was a cool move. I like to, you know, help people like that. So also look them up. They did a great job. They helped me out so much, just like everybody else. I'd like to thank Dan Salvatore for building and doing a lot of the front end fabrication and welding all the hot side stuff from monkey fab. He did an incredible job. Uh, he also did the aluminum downpipe and he also did the intercooler piping, you know, just regular fab stuff. When we cut the frame rail out, they, they put in a new piece of pipe and everything else. He also built the chute mount on the back of the car. I'd like to thank Brian tires. They did tin work in the back of the car to keep it safe and fireproof. Uh, just spend his time and, we had a battery box and everything else, but he mounted it. Uh, they did a lot of the finishing work. The, there was a tray in the back of the car that the fuel cell sat on. And it's not necessarily that any of this stuff was expensive. He just took his time to make it nice and safe in case there was an issue with the fuel tank, made mounts, all of that good stuff. So got to thank him for keeping us safe. And also, I'd like to thank me and Mike for making the parachute bracket and pieces that hold the chute that... Uh, that Dan did not make. So me and Mike, me and Mike Fab, he did a great job on that also. And uh, like I said before, I'd like to thank my wife for not pushing the car into the lake and setting it on fire or everything else because it has taken a lot of time away from her and my child. So she definitely hates this car because it has done, you know, not very, not many good things for me. It is, it's taken a lot from me, but she's happy that it has run the time and it is coming to a close. So I want to thank all those people. And then I'd like to make a second video here right after this one while everything's fresh and go over the entire cost and price sheet. So this one isn't two hours long. So that'll be next.